A place that's always been of interest to me, but I don't know as much about as I would like to, is the Indian subcontinent. And I, I say it that way, the Indian subcontinent, because I want to include places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, etc. All these places that were formerly associated with, let's call it British India. Maybe that's not even the right word, but places where there's a historical Indian influence. And I was surprised to learn how much Aramaic has to do with India. Now, it's not as formative as, say, Greek and Latin are to the rest of Europe, but it makes an appearance on more than one occasion, and it's probably survived in places that we haven't even found yet. So first, when we go back into the ancient days of King Ashoka, we can find a number of inscriptions that are in Aramaic. Now, these Aramaic inscriptions are mostly in Afghanistan in the northeast, although Kandahar is not necessarily in the northeast, it's more central, but in the northeast and um, also in Pakistan in the north. Why would these be in Aramaic and why would King Ashoka compose inscriptions in Aramaic, Greek, and the Prakrit language? Well, the main reason is because Aramaic was the language of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and so they were the neighboring force prior to Alexander. Now, Alexander and the Greeks were around prior to King Ashoka, so it's interesting that these languages persisted and would have hopefully, presumably, been understood by people who would have encountered them on their travels. Most of these have to do with events or edicts of King Ashoka, and they represent a number of different types. One is a bilingual of Greek and Aramaic, and those inscriptions, or that specific inscription rather, is not necessarily an exact translation. It looks to be two different compositions placed next to one another. Now, at some point in time, uh, Aramaic fell out of favor with the Persian Empire in the way that it did during the Achaemenids. It still persisted. Um, and in fact, it integrated with Pahlavi in a number of ways. If you ever study Middle Persian, you know, it's really interesting to see how Aramaic still persists in a Persian-specific language. And of course, in its Western provinces and, and satrapies, if they're still called that, in those days, Aramaic and Syriac persist as chief or official languages. But as far as India goes, we don't really see Aramaic inscriptions after this period. We do find a number of people coming from the Middle East or the Near East to India for different reasons. Uh, the major one, however, is the spread of the Christian faith, and that goes back by account to the preaching of St. Thomas. And in the fourth century, we have Christian-specific missions going to the Malabar coast, the present-day state of Kerala in India. Now, Christianity also was present in Maharashtra and the northwest in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, of course. Um, there were numerous dioceses in Afghanistan uh, for many years before the coming of Timurlane when Christianity retreated, and with it, the Aramaic language. However, Aramaic survived in the southern state of Kerala. And it's really fascinating to see just how much Aramaic, namely Syriac, influenced the language called Malayalam. Now, I once tried learning Malayalam. So I'm not going to try much more than that. In fact, if you ever want a hard language to learn, if you're like a polyglot watching this video and you really want to um, test yourself, try Malayalam. 
um, or Tamil or something like that. These languages are, in my experience, very, very difficult. And um, I find Akkadian much easier <laughs> than, than Malayalam. All that to say, we have some words um, that you know, come along with Christianity. I'm not sure about the first word plate, banyanam, or, um, but grave seems to be uh, much more related to Aramaic, kabra. And kabra is kabra or kauro in the Western accent. Um, now, this is a practice that is undertaken by both Christians and Muslims. Um, one could suggest that it may be just as much from Arabic. Uh, as it is from Aramaic, because they're basically the same word in Aramaic and Arab and Arabic. All that to say, we do know that the Aramaic-speaking people were present in Kerala in the fourth century, and their burial practices presumably went with them. Then we have a number of other words that are specific to Christianity that are in Malayalam, and the reason why these are worth bringing up is because in English. If you look at the English, the words, they're actually mostly from Greek, some from Latin, but mostly from Greek. And the Aramaic that came with Syriac and Syriac Christianity was formative in creating the religious language for Christians in Kerala. So a priest is a kashisha. You have the kurbana as a sacrifice. Um, you have a Kodesha as a sacrament, or Dukrana for a commemoration, the Nasrani as the Christians. Um, and these should all sound different, right, than what we may know in English for all these terms. Uh, Pharisees, pretty much a similar sounding word, Pesaha for Passover, not too different, although Passover is a different root, of course. Baba for father or patriarch. Now, that doesn't mean one's personal father. It's like a um, religious, you know, calling a, a cleric cleric, namely the patriarch, a bava. The altar is the uh, madbaha, which is madbaha in, in Syriac. Baptism, mamudisa, mamuditho, mamuditho rather. Mar for saint, uh, malaka for angel, meshiha for Christ, mshiha in Syriac. Uh, ruha, well, ruha for spirit, like ruha. Apostle, sliha, or Shleho, the deacon, um, Shemashan, or Mshamshana, and then cross, Sliba, which is interesting because there's another word for cross in Malayalam, Kurisha, and that's presumably from Portuguese. Now, this was definitely a hard language for me, but I'm truly fascinated by the presence of Aramaic in India. And if you are Indian watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have any more examples that you can think of or any other regions where Aramaic may have been of influence, um, go ahead and post them in the comments below. You know, this is a subject I'm still learning about and um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by it. And hopefully one day I'll, um, I'll take up Malayalam again. Um, it's a fun language, but it's really hard to speak. So Nandi, thank you all for watching. Taudi Ghalabe, Taudi Sagi, and Fushun Bashlomo, remain in peace.